Welcome to Change It Up Radio with Paula Shaw. I'm so glad you're here today because we really are going to be talking about a topic that I think is so, so important. We're going to be talking about navigating those tough talks. How do you navigate those tough talks? You know the ones where somebody's emotional or there's something difficult you have to say or a loss has taken place and the person you're talking to is in a kind of a fragile state. Those are the tough talks and too often we humans avoid those talks which leaves the person who's in pain feeling alone and abandoned. So my hope for this show today is that at the end of it, you're going to feel much more competent and better equipped to be able to navigate those tough talks. All right. So welcome to Change It Up Radio. As you all know, I'm Paula Shaw. I am an author, a speaker, a life transition coach, and of course, the host of this show. I am the author of Saying the Right Thing When You Don't Know What to Say, and also of Grief, When Will This Pain Ever End? I love this book because it's chock full of processes, articles, and all kinds of different tools to help people better cope with loss. So if you're dealing with any kind of loss, and that isn't just talking about death. Remember, loss is all about any kind of loss. It could be a loss of a job. It could be a loss of health. It could be a divorce. It could be a move, an unexpected move, or perhaps even losing your home. There are all kinds of losses that people go through, and they all produce grief. And when we're dealing with grief, it's really hard to know how to navigate that journey. If you did not get to hear last week's show, I went in depth into tools, processes, things we can do to navigate grief. So please catch that show. As most of you know, all our shows are archived on changeitupradio.com. That's changeitupradio.com. And you can also find us on every major podcast platform. If you would like to learn more about me, my work, or if you want to schedule a complimentary 20-minute consult with me to talk about your situation and see if I might be a fit for you to do some therapy, you can do that on paulashaw.com. That's paulashaw.com. And by the way, while you're there, grab my free gift, which is a list. And I mean sentence after sentence after sentence of 20 things to say and not to say when you're having these tough talks. That little list is a must have for your glove box, your purse, your briefcase, so that you can just do a quick review when situations come up where you're going to have to navigate a tough talk. So that's all on paulashaw.com. All righty. So let's talk just a little bit here because last week, as I discussed, in my opinion, there's way too much grief going on in the world right now. And we humans hate grief. You know, we, we, as we say every week, we need change for growth and to keep life interesting, but we hate the discomfort of the unfamiliar. And so what we really have going on, anytime things change, remember for something to change, something else has to go. And when something else goes, we're talking about loss. So change and loss 
and the subsequent grief walk hand in hand. And in the last year, everybody in the world has lived through a lot of change, a lot of loss, and subsequently a lot of grief. And so we need to get better at being able to talk competently and confidently to each other when we're dealing with difficult times. And that's why I thought we needed to deal with this topic today. Because the reason actually I wrote that book that I was just showing you saying the right thing when you don't know what to say was because I got tired of hearing people who would come to my office in tears and say, I lost my baby and nobody brought it up. My husband left me and nobody said anything. You know, nobody came by, nobody talked to me. I went to the office, no one mentioned it. And I know they all knew. And I realized exactly why people were doing that. And it isn't because they don't care. It isn't because they're thoughtless and, and awful and insensitive. It's because they're scared to death. When people are hurting, they're fragile. And none of us wants to make their pain worse. But unfortunately, because we don't feel competent to actually help them because we don't really know what to say, we end up leaving them feeling abandoned or feeling like nobody cares, wondering what's going on. And so I decided to write a book, a simple little small book, as you could see, it's, it's a very short one read book, but it's a book with very clear instructions about how to speak to somebody in a way that actually helps them to feel better. How to speak to them in a way that can actually help them heal. And so that's what I want to talk about today. So we've looked at now why we tend not to show up and why we don't feel competent. Well, I think a lot of that is because we are far better at talking about the stats of the game last night or talking about the latest fashion trend or a movie that you just saw that rocked your world. We're so much better at talking about that than we are at asking somebody, how are you feeling? I know you just went through something really tough. Do you want to talk about that? No. And, and I got to tell you, I've been guilty myself. In fact, a dear, dear friend of mine many, many years ago wanted so badly to have a child. And at one point she was pregnant and she lost the fetus. And I was one of the ones that didn't bring it up. Though I talked to her all the time, I'd have lunch with her and I'd try to cheer her up. I'd try to help her have fun, but I didn't bring up the, that elephant in the middle of the room, which was her loss. And at one point in a conversation with me, she very tactfully did not point the finger at me, but she said, it's just so weird. I went back to work and nobody has said anything. Nobody brings it up at all. And I know they all knew. And I thought to myself, oh my God, I'm on that list. I'm on that list. And I realized exactly why I was. Because if she seemed like she was okay, and guess what? She was acting okay because she didn't want to bum anybody else out. Can you imagine that? The person in pain is worried about becoming a buzzkill. But that's what so often happens. People put on that I'm fine face. You know, they put on this, this you know, the, the smile, like everything's really cool, everything's really okay, but it's not. And then they don't want to bring it up because they don't want to bum us out. Meanwhile, we are thinking 
they're actually okay and we don't want to bring it up because we don't want to then bring up the painful memory and make them feel sad. So you see how there's this ridiculous dance going on. Nobody speaking truth because nobody wants to make the other person feel bad. Meanwhile, the other person feels really bad and is having to stuff it down. And not only do they feel badly about their loss, they feel really badly that nobody seems to be interested in how they feel. Nobody's there supporting them. So that's even more distressing for them. We don't want that to happen to people we love. We want to be there to help them feel supported. We want to be there to hear them. I mean, I know that's what most people are really feeling. They want to do whatever they can to help that person in pain get out of pain. And yet, because we tend to be a society that operates much more from intellect than we do from our hearts. The intellect is so easy to build a conversation around, but the feelings are much more difficult to express. And sorry to say it, guys, but it's even harder for you because you get more acculturation to stiff upper lip, get up there, get back in the game. You're fine. Dust off yourself and, and you'll be good. You'll be good. There's a lot more of that that unfortunately happens for males and their feelings are just as real as ours. So in our next segment, we're going to talk a little bit more about what are some of the reasons that we're all not feeling a sense of confidence about how to handle that tough talk, how to help someone in pain. So we will be right back with that part of the story. Welcome back to Change It Up Radio with Paula Shaw. We're talking about how to navigate the tough talks today. And I think this is probably one of the most important shows I've ever done because it's about all of us. It's about a universal issue, a universal problem that so many of us have. And that problem is feeling comfortable enough to be there for our friends and our loved ones when they're going through painful experiences. And so I want to talk a little bit in this segment about why it's so hard. Why aren't we better? at having those feelings conversations. I know most men hear that very word and they go, oh, the feelings talk. Um, of course, women are more natural at it because we talk to each other about our feelings far more than men do. Men most often get together for a third purpose. For example, let's get together and watch the game. Let's get together and play some racquetball. You know, let's get together and drive up the coast. So there's always a thing to do. Rarely do you hear men say, hey, let's sit down and have a, a talk. Let's just really chat and get to know each other. Let's talk about what you're feeling today and how you're feeling about it. That happens, but it's much more rare. So that's one of the reasons. It's just training. It's just um, experience. Some families, when there's a problem, they all sit around the table or sit down in the living room and they talk about the problem. This is a beautiful thing. And it's so good for children to learn this skill. For one thing, it can alleviate explosive kinds of behaviors later on, which are usually a result of the fact that they've been having to keep all these feelings stuffed down or trying to keep them a secret. So learning how 
to express what you feel is a very important key in being good at these kinds of conversations later on in life. Now, family values and family experiences are one of the things that affect our communication and affect our ability to be able to be there for those comforting, supportive conversations, or what we would like to be comforting and supportive. So for example, if my family values are stiff upper lip, you know, hey, life's tough, take a deep breath and get back in the game. If that's the values I grew up with, and now I'm sitting with somebody who's sobbing and wailing and, and going on and on and on in an almost hysterical way about their pain, I'm going to feel very uncomfortable. This is not familiar territory for me. So that's one of the things that can impact communication in these situations. Another thing is societal norms and values. So the society that you grow up in has its own dictates about what's okay and what isn't. So for example, I would say in general, although we have many cultures and many people of different origins in America, but I would say in general, there's a, a, there are certain norms that we expect, let's say at a funeral. So we expect everybody to be in black or dark colors. That's a societal norm. We expect if people are going to cry, that they'll cry softly. We don't expect them to sob and wail and fall prostrate, straight, <laughs> not prostrate, prostrate on the floor. We expect certain kinds of behaviors. Those are our societal norms. So people from other societies may not behave the way we do. They may have other cultural ideas of how to handle pain. So you see, if that's going on and I'm not used to it, I'm getting uncomfortable and that's going to limit my ability to be able to help this person and support them. Unless I can step out of all that. You see, if I can move to a place of acceptance of whatever is their norm, then I'm so much better off. And so is the person that I'm trying to help. And in my job, you know, that's kind of a requirement if I'm going to do my job effectively. So I get more practice than most people. And, and so most people are not used to these kinds of conversations. They, they don't quite know how to handle it if somebody falls apart, as we sometimes say. So other things that affect how we communicate and, and how we think about expressive communication and emotions and that kind of thing. So um, cultural expectations come into play here. You know, what is normal in our culture? Well, I named one a little bit ago, which was wearing black to a funeral. Um, if somebody showed up in a bright pink dress at a funeral in our culture, we would look at that a little bit askance. But more and more, people are breaking away from cultural norms. For example, when I was growing up, and I won't talk about how long ago that was, when I was growing up, it was a cultural norm that you got married and then you had a child. Today, there's a new title out there that was not even in existence when I was young. Baby mama. She's my baby mama. That's how some men describe the woman who is the mother of their child that they love, but is not their wife. So cultural norms and cultural expectations are very real, but they do change. They can change. Cultural practices 
You know, like eating turkey on Thanksgiving, unless you're vegan. <laughs> and then you, you eat a, a vegan substitute that's in the shape of a turkey, I think. <laughs> but we have those sort of cultural practices. Then what also affects how we, how we can, can um, oh, what's the word I want? How we um, present ourselves in those difficult conversations that I like to call the tough talks. One of those things is our personal beliefs. So if you're holding a personal belief that strong people don't cry in public, it's going to be very hard for you not to judge someone who is sobbing their eyes out because of some loss they've just suffered. If you have a personal belief that um, you don't share your pain with a um, you know, in a public way that the only people you talk to are immediate family, then you're going to have a very difficult time with somebody, for example, in, in some kind of a meeting or in some kind of a group or in a workshop that really opens up and starts telling all the details of their situation or their pain. So one of the things, as you probably put together by now, that can prevent us from being effective in a difficult conversation in those tough talks is judgment. And all these things I've been discussing set us up for judgment because basically what judgment means is anybody who doesn't do it the way I do it isn't right right? Isn't that what we do? I mean, whether we realize we're doing it or not, anybody who, who doesn't do things the way we think is correct is wrong. And nobody in pain is going to be helped by being judged. So some other things that can also impact us in these conversations are peer expectations. What do our peers expect us to do? I think, you know, what my daughter's peers expect her to do in a certain situation is very different than what my peers in the boomer age range would expect me to do. Because values have changed over time. People have changed over time. And the way we do things changes. So all of these, these are just some of the things that come into play when it's time for one of those tough talks. You know, I remember when I was a child, it, when my mother was in pain, she just wouldn't talk. Or if she was upset with my dad, she would go silent. Well, she grew up in a Puerto Rican family where... They were taught, you don't air the family's dirty laundry out in public. You don't talk about this stuff to other people. So obviously, you weren't really going to talk it out with your husband either. Or maybe you did, but in private. So guess what? I got married, and the first time I was upset with my husband, I literally was trying to get words out, and I couldn't. I was so deeply acculturated to go silent when I was in pain. It was a learning process for me to be able to figure out how to talk about my upset. So as humans, it's not the easiest thing to have tough talks. But darn it, we got to get better at it, guys, especially at a time now when there's so much pain pandemic, we've got racial unrest, we've got lots of stuff going on that people need to be able to speak about, get it off their chest so that it doesn't develop into depression and anxiety and, and eating disorders and other kinds of physical illness. So all right, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about the five steps of how you have a successful tough talk.
Okay, we'll be right back. Welcome back to Change It Up Radio with Paula Shaw. We're talking about the tough talks today. And if you're just joining us, please go back after the show, of course, go back and hear the whole show because I think it's an important show. We all are talking to people these days who are dealing with loss of some kind. We all are right? Life has changed drastically since this pandemic started over a year ago. And there's so much that we're trying to adjust to. There's so much that's been taken away. And of course, good times are ahead and things will improve. But right now, we've got a lot of people in pain. We've got a lot of depressed people and a lot of anxious people. And if we love any of those people, we want to be there to support them. So in this segment, I want to talk to you about the five steps that are, that need to be present to have a successful tough talk. Okay. So the first one is setting the right intention. I talk about this all the time, but I'm going to say it one more time. Everything is energy. Everything in the entire universe is particles and waves of energy. And one of the most powerful things we can do, and I do it before everything important in my life, and when I, when I start the day each day, I set an intention. And that is simply making a statement of how I would like the thing I'm about to do to turn out. Because quantum physics has showed us that energy shows up in accordance with the expectations of the observer. So if we want the energy of this conversation to show up the way we want it to, we have to state how we want it to show up. And that is setting an intention, powerful and very, very important in every area of your life, not just in dealing with tough talks. And it's one of my favorite things to do. I don't ever start a show without setting an intention. I don't ever start a session without setting an intention. When I'm doing my work with clients before we do any of the processes we do, I set an intention because let's don't just cast our fates to the wind. Let's tell the wind how we want it to show up. Okay. Step two, be present, be present. I always say you got to have your butt and your brain in the same place for a conversation to go well. You cannot be thinking about what you have to do tonight. You cannot be thinking about the grocery list. You cannot be thinking about that fight you had with your partner this morning. You have to be right here, right now. Because that's the only way we really show up and be alive in our lives. And I'm telling you, the energy that we put out when we're actually being present is so different from the energy we put out when the brain has gone off to the past or the future. Be here now. Be present for this conversation. Because when you are, the listener will sense it or the the person you're speaking to will sense it. And then they will be able to feel safe and trust and open up on the deep levels that they need to in order for this conversation to be healing and helpful. So be present. Trust me, it shows up in the vibration you put out and the conversation will be very different when you're present versus when you're not. All right, number three come from the mindset of comforting and supporting, not teaching, not straightening them out, not getting them on the right path, not 
helping them to see the light. Don't go there because that implies judgment. And remember, we've already talked about the fact that judgment is a killer. Judgment will not help a person feel safe and will not help them open up. So come from the mindset of being there to listen, to support, to comfort. That's all you got to do. You don't have to be the guru. You don't have to be the master teacher. You just have to be a fellow human who wants to comfort and support. And that is powerful. The next step, number four, and this in many ways is the most important. And I want to tell you, I think this is important in every conversation you're ever going to have in your life. Listen. Listen. And listen with the intent to hear. Not with the intent to figure out what you're going to say next. Oh, that creates a completely different energy as well. Haven't you all been there? Like you've had conversations with somebody and you can tell the wheels are turning in their brain, not around what you're saying, but around what their response is going to be. And I got to tell you, at least for me, that is the biggest turnoff in the world. Because what it really implies is ego rather than support. It's, it's, the, the implication is, I'm more worried about what I'm going to say so I sound cool than I am in really hearing the details of your pain. And that is a turnoff, my friends. That is a turnoff to the person who is sad, the person who is hurting. And there is nothing in them that's going to feel safe to open up and trust you and share their pain. Not when they can sense that you're not really listening. And finally, the fifth step, when it's appropriate, and, and may I say that the goal in these kinds of conversations is not to sound wise and teach, but to get the person in pain to talk, to open up, to express the pain, to talk about their feelings, their thoughts, their fears, whatever is going on for them. If they're talking, they're processing and they're healing. So anytime you're speaking, the goal is not being met, really. So get the person in pain to do the most talking. Now, when it is appropriate, respond briefly. Don't go into a 10 minute story of your own unless somehow you feel it's really relevant to the situation. But I, I feel like it's most important to keep your response brief. Respond briefly from the heart, not the head. This is super important, my friends. When somebody's in pain, they need your humanity, not your database. They don't need to know all those wise things that you've been accruing over the years from the books you've read and the experiences that you've had. They need to know you hear them. So even something as simple as, oh, how painful. Oh my gosh. Oh, I feel so sad for you. I, I can't imagine how difficult this is. That says I heard them. I heard them and I'm responding from my heart. If I say something like, yeah, well, that's really, that's a difficult kind of situation, isn't it? Yeah. You know, fortunately, other people have lived through this. So you will too. Intellect versus heart. Did you hear the difference? Well, we're going to get into that in a little more depth very soon when we are, are <clears throat> talking about exactly the right things to say. You know, like I'm going to go through in our next segment sentences of things that are helpful and sentences of things that are not helpful. 
And you want to remember just that basic rule that I was just talking about. If you're present, if you're listening, if you're responding from your heart, chances are excellent that you're going to be helping that other person. But if you're into your own head, you're worried about what you're going to say, you're worried about sounding like you know what you're talking about, then you're into ego. And that probably is not going to be very helpful. Because now you're taking that person out of their heart, because they're not safe to open up and express their heart. And if they're not in their heart, then the conversation is really not meeting its goal, right? Because what we were trying to do was get them to open up and talk about their feelings and come to some place of feeling heard and understood. So again, remember those five steps. Set the right intention for the conversation. Go into it expecting the right things which are, is basically to comfort and to support and to um, allow the person to talk about whatever they need to, to heal. Secondly, be present, be right there, right there with them. Third, come from the mindset of comfort and support, not teaching, changing, or instructing. Four, listen, listen with the intent to hear, and five, when appropriate, respond briefly from the heart. That's it. And if you stay with those five steps, I guarantee you, you're going to have a great tough talk. You're going to have one that really helps and really heals. So after we take a quick break, we're going to talk about what are some things that are actually helpful to say and what are the ones that are not. Okay, we'll be right back. Welcome back to Change It Up Radio with Paula Shaw. We're talking about how to navigate the tough talks today. And I think we've been discussing some very important things. We've looked at what happens when we don't show up in those conversations that people need to have to help them heal. We've looked at why we don't show up. We have looked at why those conversations are so difficult for us versus conversations about fashion or sports or, you know, other things that are going on in the world. And we just talked about the five steps of having a successful tough conversation, a tough talk. So now we're going to look at some specifics of what are the kinds of things that are actually helpful to say, and what are the kinds of things that are not helpful to say. So first of all, I want to just review the goal of this kind of a conversation is not for you as the helper to do the majority of the talking. The goal is to get the person in pain to do the majority of the talking. Why? Because when they're speaking, they're processing. And when they're processing, they're healing. And that's why we showed up in the first place, right? To try to help them to feel better, to try and help them deal with what's going on for them. So when we, when we come into these conversations, we want to be coming from comfort and support, and we want to be listening intently and responding from the heart. So when you respond from the heart, remember, that's not about facts. That's not about intellect. That's not about past history or examples of how other people survive that. Down the road, sometimes intellectual information can be very helpful. But let's remember when people are sad, when they're grieving or when they're hurting, they are not into their 
brain. They're not into their intellect. They're into their emotion. And so if you respond to them with intellect, not only is it inappropriate, but it's not going to be very effective because that's not where they are. They can't hear intellectual information when they're in the fog of grief, when they're in the, the confusion, perhaps the anger, the shock, the dismay, the disbelief, the oh my God. When you're in the oh my God place, facts and figures don't cut it, my friends. When you're in that place, hugs, they, they cut it. When you're in that place, something like, oh, oh my gosh, I, I, I feel your pain. That's okay. You don't ever want to say, I know how you feel because that's immediately going to get somebody's defenses up and they're going to be coming from, no, you don't. You don't have any idea what it feels like to be me. And that's not going to help them to heal. That's not going to help this to be a productive conversation. So number one, I jumped ahead of myself and I'm telling you what not to say. But since it was on the table, I'm going to say it. Do not ever say, I know how you feel. You could say, I don't know exactly how you feel, but I know when I experienced something similar, I was devastated. That's on the list of helpful things to say, because that way you're not getting somebody's defenses up, but they now know that you've experienced something similar. So that actually can be a good connector. Something simple like what happened shows that you're interested and you're there and, and you want to know. And that will help them to open up because talking about the details of a tragedy are very often very helpful. That processing is very good for the person in pain. Saying something like, I'm so sorry. So that's just so real. It's so human. I'm so sorry this happened to you. I'm so sorry you're going through this. I'm so sorry. See, someone can feel the heart in that and that will help them to feel safe. To say something like, you know, remember, I'm trying to invite conversations. So I'm not asking yes and no questions. <laughs> so you can say something like, this must be such a confusing, complicated time. How are you doing? So you're wanting to invite them to process. You're wanting to invite them to express what they're feeling. Saying something like, you know, and, and this is truly one of my favorites. Um, well, two of my favorites are coming up. I can't imagine how painful this is. Well, my heart just aches for you. See, that's a good one because you're with them on that emotional level. You're connecting and that's helping them to feel safe. And then a great fallback when somebody tells you something that horrifies you, or you can't even imagine what it's like to be going through what they're going through, just say, tell the truth and just say, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say. And that's truth. And remember, authenticity is a critical part of, of helping another person feel safe. If you're being real and you're down to earth, then that's helping them to open the door to trust you. So let's look a little bit at what not to say. Um, oh, this is a classic. You got to get on with your life. You know, you've been feeling sad long enough. You got to go forward. So so many things wrong with that. Where do I begin? A, feels like teaching, feels like a lecture, feels like judgment. So we already discussed teaching, lecturing, judging, 
not helpful when we're trying to get someone to feel safe and speak about their feelings. Saying things like, don't cry, tears aren't going to change anything. Oh my goodness, how many of us have heard that one? And again, judgment, intellect, all the things that don't make the conversation go well. This is a classic. I'm sure we've all heard this at one time or another. You have to be strong. You got to get back in the game. Oh my God, don't we know that? When we're in pain or when we're having a hard time or when we're grieving, we want to be strong. We want to get back into our lives. If it was totally under our control, don't you think we'd be there? Don't you think I'd have moved to that quite a while ago? So making a statement like that only makes a person feel defective. It only makes them feel that they're not measuring up. So you don't want to say things like that. Saying inane, and I, I'm sorry, but inane is the word I have to use. Inane things like, at least you have other children to someone who just lost a child. Oh my God. Like the one that they lost didn't matter except that it was a child and hey, there are more. No problem. You cannot say those things. God must have needed him more than you do. Really? Oh, that'll get somebody's hackles up. So just wipe those old, and we've all heard them. We've all been to funerals where people have either said those things to us or we've heard them say them to somebody else. Not helpful, not useful. Saying something like, well, you know, you're not the only one this has ever happened to. You'll get over it. Well, I'm the only one I've ever felt it happening to. And I'm not sure right now that I am going to get over it. That's the kind of response that kind of a statement elicits. So it's not helpful. So remember, come from your heart, come from authenticity, come from supporting and comforting. And then you can't go wrong. Tell your truth, be authentic, even if it's just like, I don't even know what to say. Be authentic. And then I want to offer a few suggestions. If you're the person who's in pain and someone has said one of these inane treasures to you, here are a few possible things you can say in response to them. Thank you for your concern. It means a great deal to me. But right now, I just need to be alone. Because remember, people, are, people mean well. Even as they're speaking, those inane statements that I was just discussing, they mean well. So just trying to minimize it, saying something like, I'm really having a hard time talking, but could you just sit quietly with me? Or could we just watch a movie together? Something like that can be really good. But you should respond in some way because otherwise anger can build up because some of the things they say really do tick you off. Something like, there really don't seem to be any good answers. I'm just trying to get through this. That can be a good statement. And that sometimes will just quiet that person down who's offering those inane statements that aren't helping at all. So unfortunately, there's so, many, so much more I could say, but remember, the list of 20 things to say and not to say is my free gift to you on paulashaw.com. So go get that list. And you can also buy the book on Amazon, saying the right thing when you don't know what to say. I am so happy we had this conversation today. I'm so glad we got to talk about this because it's so important. So remember, you can hear this show on Sunday evenings at 9 o'clock on AM 1170 and FM 96.1 in San Diego. And you can hear us on every major podcast platform, including iHeartRadio, Blog Talk Radio, and Podopolo, one of my new favorite platforms. So join us next week 
when Dr. Aliza Cicerone, who is a naturopathic oncologist, will be joining me and we're going to be talking about gut health and alternative cancer support, integrative cancer support. It's going to be a wonderful show packed with great information. So please join me. We'll see you next week on Change It Up Radio. Bye-bye.